examples and the chairpersons for a power play startup. I hope so. It will surely reflect in the sessions for unmuting all women on menopause. Let's move on to the next session on panel discussion moderated by Dr. J. Vidya, consultant endocrinologist, Kovai Medical Center and Hospital, Coimbatore. She was awarded for her presentation at national and regional meetings in UK. She has multiple publications in international conferences. I request Madam to take over the session and introduce the speakers. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it gives me great pleasure in uh, being part of this uh, trendo. Uh, this session is going to be a panel discussion of discussing four cases. We have um, in the panels two endocrinologists and two gynecologists. Um, Dr. Anjali um, Satya is a consultant endocrinologist at Vijaya GP of Hospitals, Apollo Specialty Hospitals at uh, Vanagram. Her special interests are in diabetes, thyroid disorders, reproductive endocrinology. She's been in clinical practice for more than 15 years, and she's got several international and national publications. We have with us Dr. Chitra. She's an obstetrician, additional professor at uh, JIPMA. Um, she's done a fellowship in minimal access uh, surgery and in reproductive medicine. She's done fellowship in advanced um, laparoscopy, infertility, and ultrasonography. Uh, she's got the best paper award for many papers presented at national and international conferences. Uh, Dr. Asha Rao Award for best poster presentation and several other awards in international conferences. And she's published um, several papers in many reputed national and international journals. We have with us Dr. Krishna Shankar. He's an endocrinologist uh, from Ramakrishna Hospital, uh, Coimbatore. I know him very well because I uh, work in Coimbatore as well. And he's got multiple uh, publications to his credit. Welcome, uh, Krishna. We have with us Dr. Uma Vail Murugan. Um, she is a gynecologist. Um, she's done fellowship in reproductive medicine and well from Birmingham Women's Hospital, Birmingham, UK. She's a managing director and chief consultant, Venus Fertility Center, Trichy. Um, a consultant in obstetrics and gynecology, Apollo Specialty Hospitals in Trichy. She's completed RCOG advanced training uh, special modules in reproductive medicine and assisted conception and in advanced uh, labor ward management. So I'm just going to share with uh, you all the slides. Um, so there's going to be four cases, um, scenarios on obesity, diabetes, thyroid, and hyperprolactinemia, and how they are related to subfertility. We're not going to dwell too much on management of these conditions during pregnancy because we know that uh, the sessions following this session are purely focusing on polycystic ovarian syndrome, diabetes, and thyroid disorders in pregnancy. So the first uh, case scenario is uh, looking into how obesity could affect uh, the fertility in a woman. So this is a 38-year-old woman who presents to the endocrine outpatient department. She's been married for eight years now, and she's keen to get pregnant with no success at all. She gets periods once in uh, two months and it lasts for about five days. She does not have any other medical illness. Her, fa her father is slim built, but her mother and sister are both obese. Her BMI is 35. She does not have any uh, features of hyperandrogenism such as hirsutism or acne. And she's keen to get pregnant as soon as possible. So my question to Dr. Chitra is, what is the risk of infertility in obese women compared to non-obese women? Yeah. Uh, before all, I would like to thank you, Vidya, for their kind introduction. And I thank the organizing team for giving an opportunity to be panelists. It is, was a wonderful session till now. Thank you so much. Uh, the main risk of infertility, I think the prevalence of obese infertility is very high. And already many studies have been shown there's association between obesity and infertility. The risk is, uh, I think, three times higher than in uh, non-obese women. And whether patient conceives naturally or in conception, and this, uh, this infertility has been affected in almost all these patients who are obese. Uh, studies have shown that for every unit rise of uh, uh, more than BMI like 32, no, there is always a decrease in conception by at least 5%. So uh, this obesity itself might lead to menstrual cycles, irregularity, anoti cycles. This itself also may, may be one of the main problems for infertile, I mean, having a high incidence of infertile in obese women compared to this uh, uh, non-obese women. 
Dr. Anjali, how would you assess the cause of obesity clinically, especially in this 38-year-old woman with a BMI of 35? Uh, thank you, Dr. Vidya, and thank you, Trendo team, for this wonderful opportunity. So I think here we are uh, coming across a scenario where a woman is married for eight years and she is really anxious to conceive. And second pro problem she is facing is her weight. And she has a BMI which is classified into obesity. So the first thing is when we evaluate such an individual uh, in our outpatient, uh, we first take, try to take a good history. History would be a family history, which is well shown in the history itself that mother and sister also have obesity. So is it that this individual had obesity in childhood that has tracked into adolescence and now into adulthood? If so, then there is a very strong genetic element to it because obesity has several etiology. One is a strong genetic, second is lifestyle. So we need to really look into her lifestyle, her job. Does it involve changing shifts? Does she sit for a long time? What amount of physical activity she's doing? Regarding her diet, does she have an erratic meal pattern? Is she on a lot of carbs? Uh, third thing is, of course, uh, lifestyle. Would, we would also ask for a history of sleep because of this night shifts. Many of these women may have sleep deprivation that may add to weight gain. An important history would also include medication history. Is she on any medication which is likely to cause weight gain in this individual? Like we do use low corticosteroids for many, many medical indications. Is she on any antidepressants? Such a long period of subfertility, she's likely to have psychological issues like anxiety and depression. Probably we need to dwell deeper into that. Is she already a hypertensive? Does she have already pre-existing medical conditions that we need to check? And yes, if we have to look for clinical features suggestive of underlying endocrine problems, does she have a goiter? Does she have symptoms suggestive of hypothyroidism? In that case, we need to investigate her along that line. Does she then uh, on clinical examination, of course, uh, we try to look at uh, the fat distribution. What kind of fat distribution does it have? Does she have? Is it a central obesity? Or does she have a more of abdominal or obesity, which is likely to be visceral in nature? And that is associated with higher prevalence of metabolic syndrome and cardiovascular risk. Does she have more of an upper body obesity or is it more fat in the subcutaneous region or a generalized obesity, which may not be associated with a higher uh, you know, prevalence of metabolic syndrome? On clinical examination, we should also look at her BMI, waist circumference, which is an indirect measure of her uh, abdominal or trunkal obesity. We look for features of insulin resistance like acanthosis, which is a dark pigmentation around the nape of neck, flexures. Does she have skin tags? which is again a marker of insulin resistance. Does she have features of hyperandrogenism, which you mentioned that she does not have? So she has obesity. Probably we need to look for features of insulin resistance. If not hyperandrogenism, probably we are not dealing with PCOD. Does she have Cushingoid features? Now, this is something we pick up a lot of these women with Cushing syndrome from obesity clinic itself. And the history would be more classical. It wouldn't be a childhood onset obesity tracking into adulthood. It would be a more recent onset and rapidly progressive obesity. The pattern of weight gain is also more centripetal, more in the central region, and they have thin extremities. Blood pressure is, again, a very important element of physical examination where we can almost like detect whether she has hypertension, either uncontrolled, which is if it is pre-existing, or does she have a newly detected hypertension? And then we go along those lines. As you rightly said, uh, Dr. Anjali, we do get referred a lot of patients uh, for obesity assessment. And the first thing the patient thinks is there's really truly a hormonal abnormality that's causing their weight gain rather than a genetic cause or a lifestyle um, a reason for obesity. And as you rightly said, we shouldn't forget that steroid is being uh, widely abused or used in, um, in India for various reasons. And steroids are glucocorticoids are um, widely available over the counter and the patients can just drop in and just get their um, uh, prescription uh, reissued without a, a fresh prescription issued by the doctor. So uh, chronic glucocorticoid use could also be uh, is, is one of the major drugs that causes uh, obesity in the Indian population. So Dr. Chitra, how would you, um, what initial investigations, lab investigations or imaging investigations do you think is needed in this patient? Um, 
Uh, first of all, I think in obesity patients, there's a lot of uh, chances of she going into metabolic syndrome. So we need to do the basic investigation, the infertile, the hormonal profile. We need to do uh, the baseline ultrasound on the day two to see their ORM volume, the number of follicles, and any uterine abnormalities because this obesity acts on both this endometrium and the ovaries. So you need to see the endometrial thickness. Then you have to get the hormones done like a luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, thyroid profile, which is associated with this protein level and even because hyperandrogenism is also exist in the obesity patients you need to get a, a serum testosterone done on DHA HOMA and these patients are more prone for insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia so you need to get the glucose tolerance test or the fasting glucose uh, or fasting insulin levels and do the uh, HOMA insulin resistance. So these are the baseline investigations and depends upon the uh, treatment what she is getting you can add up on the investig other investigations. Okay. So of all these investigations, uh, which one do you think is the uh, most important? Do you, we don't do all these blanket yeah. investigations, especially the HOMA index, and we yeah. do not do those in clinical practice for every obese patient who comes in for infertility assessment. So I think we would be looking basically to see if the Look patient has got features things. of yeah. metabolic Look. syndrome and if the patient has got evidence of a fatty liver lipid profiles and and to rule out other causes of obesity like you know hormone wise as we mentioned um dr chitra again how does obesity affect fertility when the patient does not have any uh, of these conditions such as polycystic ovarian syndrome or diabetes or hypothyroidism is there any way obesity per se can affect fertility if so how as I've already told you, you know, the obesity itself might have a patient uh, effect on the menstrual cycles. They might have an altered menstrual cycles which might lead to annual cycles. And this, uh, it is all might result in the immaturity or in the affection of this uh, hypothermia pituitary ovarian axis. Uh, in studies have shown that in cases with obesity, what happens is gonadotrin secretion is uh, affected because there's a peripheral atomization of androgens to estrogen. And this associated insulin resistance and the hyperinsulin in this obese patient may lead to hyperandrogenia, which might have again deleterious effects on this uh, endometrium thickness. It might lead to high risk of miscarriages. And uh, various hormones like uh, sex hormone binding globulin or uh, growth factors or insulin like this, all these are, are the, I mean, decreased in levels. And there's uh, leptin levels also are increased. So this also might have a deleterious effects. So these are the things which create an environment for that, which fails in the uh, uh, patient having a normal ovulation and might affect her infertility. I'm sorry, fertility. So inflammation could play a, may, uh, a significant role apart from the hormones. It is so uh, inflammation in the or in micro environment, there is an inflammatory factors, oxidative risk factors, which are more increased compared to a non-obese. And this also I've shown to have an effect on this uh, uh, fertility of these patients. Okay. Oh. Dr. Anjali, what is the role of adipokines? This is following the, um, the previous question. What's the role of adipokines in subfertility? Um, Dr. Vidya, I would like you to go to the previous investigation slide, which I would like to focus a little bit. Yeah. Now, from an endocrinologist's point of view, we wouldn't do a blanket investigation for an individual. I think we will go very focused yeah. on any person who comes to our clinic. So if you are coming across an obese lady who does not have features of hyperandrogenism, I don't think we need to look at testosterone and DHEAs. So what we may mainly look at is the metabolic profile. We offer a 75 gram GTT, which may pick up an IGT or a TRAM diabetes many a time because most of these patients are asymptomatic. A fasting lipid profile, which will tell us how severe or bad it is. Liver enzymes is only a marker because many of these women with PCOD can have fatty liver or so-called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which warrants aggressive lifestyle change. Uric acid, again, is a marker of uh, metabolic syndrome. So a woman with higher uric acid, probably when we do this test, it becomes a more motivating factor for her when we describe the abnormalities detected for her to exercise and lose weight. The overnight exam suppression test, I would like to focus. We try to do in those women who present with a PCOD-like picture, they may have moderate to severe uh, hirsutism, central obesity, and features suggestive of Cushing's. There we give dexamethasone, 0.5 milligram, two tablets at 11 p.m. and check a cortisol the next day morning at 8 a.m. If the cortisol is well suppressed below 1.2 micrograms, we are almost ruling out Cushing syndrome. In any woman who presents with subfertility, we should evaluate them for uh, thyroid functions as we have, we have a very high prevalence in our population. And if she presents with anovulation, we need to check for prolactin as well. 
So these are the uh, investigation points which I would like to focus on from an endocrinologist's point of view. The second question that you are mentioning was the role of adipokines. So what we have now identified is fat is not an inactive organ. It's a very, very active endocrine tissue. It's a source for a lot of chemokines and adipokines. They are known as adipokines, some of these. So it is considered to be a source of a regular supply of this inflammatory marker. So if a person is in, uh, obese and has a higher body fat, it is considered to be a chronic inflammatory state. And this is, there are uh, adipokines which reduce insulin resistance like adiponectin, but most of the cytokines, they increase insulin resistance like TNF-alpha, IL-6, IL-1, beta, and so on. And also some of these chemokines are pro-coagulatory like uh, plasminogen activator inhibitor 1, and all these chemokines lead to insulin resistance. So this is the basic pathophysiology. Obesity, it leads to a higher pro-inflammatory state, and that leads to insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia. This hyperinsulinemic state can lead to stimulation of leading cell compartment and leading to hyperandrogenism. So that's why one factor leads to another. So once we try to you know, tell the individual, and in fact, one more clinical marker for a pro-inflammatory state would be an HSCRP, which I didn't add here highly sensitive C-reactive protein. We don't do that regularly. But then again, we find that to be elevated in most of these women who have obesity as a complicating issue. Um, thank you, Dr. Anjali. Um, Dr. Chitra, what is the association between obesity and miscarriage rate? If you can just tell us briefly. Yeah, actually, I've already told you the main factor uh, between these two is like uh, it creates a hyperandrogenic environment, which is quite deleterious for the fetus to grow and might have increased chances of uh, uh, miscarriage in these patients. And also they have uh, uh, other hormones like leptin levels, which are shown to be increased that also has a deleterious effects on the uh, environment, microenvironment, and uh, other hormones like uh, sex hormone binding globulin, uh, insulin growth factors, all these are decreased. So these are the things which have an effect uh, which might lead to increase in miscarriage rate. Thank you. Uh, just one, uh, one last question um, about, do you do AMH in these patients and what would be th the role in this uh, lady? Especially, I'm asking this question because she's a 38 year old um, who's trying to get pregnant. Yeah. What is the role of AMH in this patient? Actually, it has a, uh, AMH is one of the very sensitive marker in assessing the ovarian rhythm, and especially in patients who are more than 35 years of age group. And since she's 38 years, 100%, we need to get an AMH done, especially in the patient uh, obesity. It has shown that uh, around at least around 50 to 65% patients have a lower levels than that of these uh, uh, non-obese patients. So AMH is a must. It should be done uh, because it is the AMH level which shows how the patient responds to the treatment. And there are uh, uh, various things in, uh, in obesity. AMH is going to get more affected than in a non-obese patients because uh, this uh, obesity causes a disruption in the ovarian follicular environment, which has effect on the AMH. And there is issues and there is um, uh, altered uh, what you call uh, hormone metabolism and binding. This also has effect on the AMH levels. So the lesser the AMH levels, the lesser that she responds to the treatment and the lesser the chances, like the, she needs more chances, uh, like increasing the dosage of gonadotropins or increasing in ch chances of any evolution drugs. So AMH becomes a very important uh, this thing in uh, uh, evaluation of patients with obesity. So, so sometimes wow. in an elderly woman with or, or elderly or, or in a patient who's over the age of 35 and who's obese, the, the older you are and the more obese you are, the level of AMH is low. Yeah, even there, actually, when some I'm sure there is an inverse relationship between the uh, this obesity and AMH because uh, it has shown that uh, if any patient who are obese, they're having a decreased ovarian reserve, and any patient who are obese that is always associated with follicular uh, dysfunction. So that's why reason they get uh, uh, they have they do not show much response to the oral stimulation drugs, whether either in uh, normal cycles or I mean sorry in, in oral induction cycles or in an uh, ART cycles. So the same age is very important to plan our uh, ovulation induction drugs or uh, orange stimulation drugs. So I think you answered the next question as well. How does obesity influence fertility uh, treatment? So yeah. dose yeah. of the required 
for induction uh, ovulation is really delhi, i think it is very dilemma to uh, treat a patient who are obesity first i think may, more imp most important thing what we have to tell is like uh, decrease in adiposity fat this is one of the very, very important uh, role that we should ask the patient to lose weight so that they become more responsible to the ovulation induction drugs either for the fertility drugs or for the stimulation drugs because uh, if the patient doesn't lose her weight what are the stimulation drugs we are going to give it might lead to a high cancellation rate or can you might get only a little bit only little loose ritual can be can and it might lead to more miscarriage rate or decrease in the clinical pregnancy rate so most important factor in any patient with obesity is the first is a weight reduction it has shown to have a lot of improvement in the uh, fertility treatment what is given to these uh, ladies Uh, thank you, Dr. Shetra. I remember when I was uh, practicing in UK, they will not start any kind of uh, assisted reproductive th therapy unless the BMI is less than 32. I don't know if the cutoff has changed, but when I was uh, training, they wouldn't even consider um, uh, evaluation unless the BMI is um, much lower. Even so, five percent of weight reduction as a even a reduction of five percent of weight is having a good effect on this. Uh, any of these ovulation induction drugs or uh, stimulation drugs you are going to give. Okay, I, and this is the last question. What is the role of metformin in obese patients without diabetes? This is a question for Dr. Anjali because we do come across um, a lot of patients for uh, who have polycystic ovaries but do not have diabetes who come into our clinic on metformin. So, if they do not have, they have just obesity without PCOS, would you consider metformin? And if PCOS, would you consider metformin? This question is both for Dr. Anjali and Dr. Chitra, but I would like Dr. Anjali to take this question first. So I think let me just uh, start with uh, uh, obesity management as such. So uh, we don't start with pharmacological therapy for any individual who is struggling to lose weight, and we have evidence to back us to say that lifestyle intervention is the most most important thing. As Dr. Chitra rightly pointed out. That even a minimal weight loss of say just to the tune of five percent can restore the irregularity in uh, menstrual cycles, can even make them ovulatory. They may conceive without intervention. But in the clinical scenario that you mentioned here, is a woman who has already crossed her time, and there is hardly any time interval for her to lose weight. But still, we would encourage her to, uh, you know, um, change her diet. And we have different diet. I think there is. It, it would be a discussion for more than one hour to what sort of diet would we advise. So it depends on what clinical parameters we have detected. Does she have? So you said this woman does not have diabetes, and here only we are focusing on weight loss. Then metformin as an agent for weight loss actually has a very mild effect, mild to modest effect. And if you want to use metformin for weight loss, uh, it, you have to use it uh, in a very high dosage, which would exceed 1.5 grams, and that would be associated with GI, severe GI side effects. So metformin as a primary anti-obesity treatment for an obese woman without diabetes. probably i would not consider that because uh, we do, metformin would help them in suppressing appetite it would suppress uh, you know improve the insulin resistance but it's not going to aid them in weight loss to the degree which we would desire in her and that is achievable by good lifestyle intervention yes. we also have other anti obesity medications available in the market uh, like we do have liraglutide which is a glp1 agonist now a woman you know that is fda approved for obesity even without diabetes we can offer liraglutide 3 mg subcutaneous we we have certain hormones the basis for this is we have hunger hormones we have satiety hormones glp1 is a satiety hormone so we use glp1 receptor agonist we can probably offer them some degree of weight loss but essentially i think as a primary physician i would focus on lifestyle intervention more than using metformin in a obese patient without diabetes even now evidence based uh, medicine if you try to practice for women with pcod we would try to use metformin only in those category of women with pcod who show some degree of uh, glucose intolerance either igt or frank diabetes a woman who has normal glucose uh, tolerance and who doesn't have diabetes probably metformin may not be used as a primary therapy even in pcos so lifestyle modification a good diet now i think i would also mention intermittent fasting because uh, that is uh, uh, you know we have low calorie diet low carbs uh, low carb uh, calorie restricted diet we have low fat high fiber diet we have ketogenic diet but again that leads to very severe dyslipidemia this intermittent fasting is a more time restricted frame where we try to you know it is we have evidence to prove that it improves insulin resistance in women with pcod here we have a targeted fasting period of say 12 to 14 hours and you try to eat a balanced diet in the remaining hours 
And the mechanism is that it uh, probably does not give a stimulus for insulin release and reduces hyperinsulinemia on a long-term basis. So we have alternate day fasting or we have daily fasting. You can have a periodic fasting, say two days a week, or you can have an alternate day restricted fasting. One day you have 25% of your calories and one day normal diet. So all these, the weight loss, which is achieved with different methods is comparable. Nothing is superior to the other. Essentially what the message needs to go to the woman is she needs to be on a healthy diet, which is low calorie genic, and she needs to put in more hours of physical activity. So I think that would aid a lot, uh, rather than using metformin as a primary weight reducing agent. Thank uh, you, Dr. Yeah, Anjali. Dr. Chitra, do you have anything more to add? Uh, actually, uh, what Madam told us, but in our infertility treatment in PCOS, uh, I mean, I don't think so any role of uh, giving it in a non-PCOS woman, but in a PCOS woman with uh, this thing, giving a treatment with metformin have shown to have an improvement in both yeah. Uh, ovulation rate and even in the conception rate and the live birth rate. But still a lot of um, non-randomized studies have been done. Uh, very few randomized studies have shown that it has its improvement. So we are giving metformin pay of, um, for patients uh, who are PCOS. That's why we are continuing, though we don't have a good uh, outcome. But it is all uh, individual experience. Yeah, that's that's the reason for posting a question to both of you. So we're going on to the next case, diabetes and subfertility. So this is a 28-year-old type 1 diabetic with a BMI of 19, HbA1c of 8%. So this is a question for Dr. Uma and um, Dr. Krishna Shankar, who are the next panelists. The patient is on a mixed insulin, type 1 diabetes on mixed insulin, married for four years, and she's very keen to conceive. She's got irregular periods since menarche, but, but for the past six months, she does not have any periods at all. So this is a question to Dr. Uma. How does diabetes per se, cause subfertility? Um, Dr. Uh, yeah. Ji, um, thank you for giving us this opportunity to be part of the team. Diabetes, type 1 diabetes, uh, as such, is, uh, got a, it's a, it is an autoimmune disease. We all know that. And uh, we know that the insulin is deficient and there is a lot of subcutaneous fat as well in some of these women, which in turn causes a low levels of leptin which sometimes might cause hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, which might cause a delay in puberty, as well as uh, because it does affect the ovulation, so it causes irregular menstrual cycles. So when you have irregular menstrual cycles, you know that uh, subfertility is one of the main um, features which is associated with that. Uh, next thing is like we give iatrogenic insulin and sometimes iatrogenic hyperinsulinemia is caused in these women which might lead to polycystic ovary-like syndrome. And uh, because of that, her menstrual cycles could be irregular. And with PCO, we know that uh, subfertility is one of the major effects. And um, hyperglycemia causes apoptosis of the follicles, and it does cause early menopause sometimes. So uh, the reproductive age, the number of years of the reproductive years these women have is uh, quite less. So this is... Um, a few mechanisms by which diabetes causes subfertility in this type 1 diabetes especially causes in this women. Uh, Dr. Krishna, in this type 1 diabetic patient who is keen to conceive, how will you optimize the glycemic control? So, uh, hello, uh, good morning everyone and uh, I thank uh, the organizer of Chendo for providing me this opportunity. Well, uh, I will just to, uh, like to add one or two points to before answering this question to Dr. Uma, Madam's answers also. So there, there may be an association of autoimmune hypogonadism also. So patient can go for premature ovarian failure in case of type 1 diabetes. So that's the, that needs to be added in mind. So optimization of, so how to manage diabetes per se. So type 1 diabetes, hope the patient was being established as a type 1 diabetes. So many a times it's a common occurrence that just because diabetes occurs in youth, uh, we tend to think it's type 1 diabetes. So that era is changing. So there is a possibility of type 2 or other syndromic diabetes too. So that's need to be kept in mind. So apart from that, uh, the insulin regimen has to be changed. If it's a type 1 diabetes, uh, the rule of thumb is simple. Just copy nature. It is basal bolus insulin. So the rule of thumb is it is a basal, a long-acting insulin plus two or three, usually it's two or three boluses uh, insulin. So that will be the first change to be done in this patient 
to be proved as type 1 diabetes so that that will uh, slow down the chances of hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia and glycemic variability and of course improve the nutrition too so that will be the first point the second point is frequent uh, glucose monitoring either way of smbg that is self monitoring blood glucose by the conventional glucometer or now in the past 5 years it's a era of continuous glucose monitoring so there are two to three kinds of continuous glucose monitoring where uh, people have seen uh, attaching a small 5 rupee like disc and uh, using a, a reader a small cell phone like device reader just to uh, monitor the glucose variations and accordingly change uh, our insulin regimens and also based on your food and type and quality and quantity of food so this has to be the optimization so Shut what diet yeah. yeah what diet do you recommend to this lady with a low bmi who uh, we have confirmed to have type 1 diabetes she does not have type 2 diabetes so she has type 1 diabetes and she has a lowish bmi so what do you recommend to this lady who needs to get pregnant because we know that nutrition also is good nutrition is also important it's just not low carb diet so what do you recommend to this woman so uh, for this lady um, so theoretically speaking we need to increase to at least 30 to 40 kilocalorie per kg per day so what we assume is maybe if she is say 165 to 170 cm and uh, she weighs around 55 to 65 kg or even less than that so we have to increase her quantity of almost uh, or even the carbohydrate ratios even the proteins even the fat in a proportionate way 50 to 60% of carbo carbohydrates 20 to 30% of fat and 20 to 30% of protein and better not jump into uh, high glycemic index foods so we should not just forget she is a diabetic also not just losing weight uh, so go for low to moderate glycemic index foods and increase the proportion increase proportionately her calories until she gains the bmi uh, jumps to at least 20 to 21 and thereafter you can maintain come down to 25 to 30 kilocalories per kg per day so being said so it's not easy so a lot of motivation and uh, communication with the patient implying that they should not get obese too so that might be a tendency that the doctor has told you to eat lots so practically speaking we should uh, the basic thing is frequent communication and motivation to gain weight to the optimal bmi not to exceed that so as we discussed even uh, it's both sides of the coin low bmi may cause hypothalamic amenorrhea and higher bmi Uh, may be exposed to be exposed to a pcos like situation so it's a balanced diet so that would be ideal and always in consultation with the registered uh, dietitian also and the and the entire team along with the physician endocrinologist substitution also so this lady is amenorrheic but then uh, you know fortunately or unfortunately she becomes pregnant with a hp1c of 8% so this is not so uncommon we do come across in clinical practice where the patient gets lost to follow up and presents to us several years later pregnant so what would be the risk to the patient and the fetus if she gets pregnant now with a hp1c of 8% okay. and so, what would have been the ideal uh, hp1c chart common scenario and what is being extremely common so yeah, many times they would just put on some insulin so the, the hp1c drops from 10 9 to 8 and suddenly get pregnant they will come to know around 8 weeks only so the maternal risk being again miscarriage miscarriage diabetic ketoacidosis um so dka if you are maintaining some insulin usually dka doesn't occur even if it is a mixed insulin if you are maintaining some long acting insulin usually dka doesn't occur but concomitant infection say supposing they have a urinary infection dka can occur and it can be uh, in pregnancy it can be sometimes life threatening a patient can go for acute kidney injury quickly rapidly they can deteriorate so retinopathy so a lot of times and even guidelines for the past 20 years have shown there is a rapid acceleration of diabetic retinopathy usually for retinopathy to accelerate it takes years together 5 to 10 to 15 years whereas in case of type 1 diabetes particularly at the onset of during pregnancy uh, it can be 10 times more rapid 5 to 10 times uh, more rapid and even they can for vitreous hemorrhage so pah again a common a common occurrence well known recurrent uti so asymptomatic bacteria going into a, even a pyelonephritis has occurred quite commonly so fetal defects again it's quite common but depends on the uh, duration of and the magnitude of hb1c so neural tube defects cardiac defects like asd vsd tetralogy of failure usually it occurs beyond hb1c of 9 and 
but you can have subtle defects and a prematurity as well as post data pregnancies so all these can occur okay and also i would like to add that one should not forget that in the first trimester of pregnancy for diabetic women presents with vomiting we should not just assume that the patient has got pregnancy induced vomiting or hyperemesis gravidarum the patient might as well have a uh, diabetic ketoacidosis might present with dka and the blood sugars might be normal there's an entity called euglycemic ketoacidosis which can occur in pregnancy so even if the blood sugar is normal in a pregnant woman who feels unwell and is coming with vomiting we'll have to monitor and check for ph and serum ketones so that we do not miss euglycemic ketoacidosis so what for the assessment will she need before she becomes uh, pregnant dr krishna yes so if the lady is properly uh, booked in the antenatal clinic as well as the endocrine clinic so urine albumin creatinine ratio which is done everywhere at very cheap cost retinal screening is a must uh, uh, to, for the baseline uh, retinal assessment so thyroid why you mentioned is all anyway all antenatal patients are going to get thyroid checked up the occurrence of almost 25 to 50% of uh, hypo or sometimes hyperthyroidism in type 1 diabetes so it can be easily picked up and improve uh, outcomes can be improved so vitamin b12 again pernicious anemia is a fact it's autoimmune disorder along with um, type 1 diabetes celiac disease why specific it's not uh, uh, conventionally routinely checked but if the uh, lady uh, has low bmi in spite of a not a too high hbo1c and no other factors it may be prudent to just think of celiac disease and liver function test if again low bmi so for either for nash or sometimes a patient can have autoimmune hepatitis so why i'm emphasizing this autoimmune etiology is uh, just for discussion sake as from an endocrine perspective they are not common though but much more common than general population type 1 diabetes just to look for autoimmune hepatitis which can get flared up during pregnancy i think dr krishna has answered this question of what other causes of infertility yes. uh, we see in this women with autoimmune disorder is we'll have to remember that hashimotos again is an autoimmune disorder we have come across patients with graves disease because this lady has got type 1 diabetes low bmi we should make sure that she is not thyrotoxic um addisons celiac all these could be the reasons for low bmi so we should remember and as dr krishna said autoimmune primary ovarian failure could also be a reason for amenorrhea in this uh, women with uh, type 1 diabetes how would you evaluate i think we have covered um that um in dr krishna session of how we would evaluate the autoimmune uh, disorder so sometimes even in new thyroid patients we may have to check for thyroid antibodies if the patient is not conceiving and if there is an already an existing pre-existing autoimmune disorder we don't do thyroid antibodies in all the patients with in you know if, if there's prolonged infertility and there's subclinical hypothyroidism we do do that so going on to the third case thyroid and subfertility the 26 year old woman referred to the endocrine clinic from the obstetrics gynae clinic she is 6 weeks um, um pregnant um this is a second pregnancy her uh, first pregnancy was 3 years ago and she miscarried at 8 weeks and uh, looking retrospectively her tsh was 7.4 milli units per liter she does not have any past medical illness and today the tsh in the clinic is 5.6 milli units per liter dr anjali how would you evaluate an elevated tsh in a pregnant woman uh dr anjali so uh looking at this clinical scenario we are uh, seeing a young woman who has had a miscarriage uh, in the past and she presents with what we term as subclinical hypothyroidism where uh, she has a borderline elevated tsh may have a normal t4 and t3 levels uh in this individual who has had a past history of miscarriage yes uh, uh we need to treat even minimal degrees of hypothyroidism whether it is subclinical or overt hypothyroidism we do treat these women with thyroxine all antenatal women are evaluated for thyroid function because in india we have a very high general prevalence of hypothyroidism uh, and because of high population prevalence we do not do a targeted screening but in fact we do a universal screening for all our antenatal women but in the western countries probably we still practice uh, a targeted screening only for those women who have strong family history of autoimmune thyroid disease or other autoimmune conditions now thyroid antibody status in this individual is not going to change our therapeutic decision 
whether it is going to be positive or negative, we are going to treat even subclinical degree of hyperthyroidism. Because as we all know, hyperthyroidism leads to adverse maternal outcomes. It can lead to a higher, prevalent, um, a higher prevalence of uh, miscarriage rates. It, it can lead to uh, just higher prevalence of gestational hypertension, um, placental aberration, uh, premature delivery. So to uh, achieve a good outcome in the mother, we would definitely treat her for this degree of hyperthyroidism. The second reason is hypothyroidism to any degree also affects the neonatal outcomes. It is required for, thyroxine is required for the neuropsychological development, especially for neural myelination and neuronal migration. The fetal thyroid start functioning only after 13 to 14 weeks. Until that time, it is dependent on the maternal thyroid reserve. So if mother is even minimally hypothyroid, we should offer her thyroxine therapy right from the day we have diagnosed it. So here, the thyroid antibody status is not going to help us in therapeutic decision because we are going to treat. But yes, presence of thyroid antibody tells us two things. One is uh, we have clinical evidence to back us up to say that higher thyroid antibody titers have a high association with uh, miscarriage rates. Number two, these women who have high thyroid antibody, the chance of progression of the subclinical hypothyroidism as the pregnancy advances is very high. So if the high antibody titers are extremely high, we need to follow these women very closely in the initial uh, uh, weeks of pregnancy till mid gestation. That is in pregnancy, we monitor every four weeks, four to six weeks. And after mid gestation, probably only one point uh, estimation at 32, 36 weeks is enough. And these women with thyroid antibody titers, which are elevated are also at higher risk for postpartum thyroiditis. So this treatment, we may stop after delivery, but we may have to reassess her six weeks postpartum and thereafter six months postpartum because they have a high prevalence of postpartum thyroiditis and also a higher prevalence of postpartum depression. So I think thyroid antibody status helps us to prognosticate in this scenario. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anjali. So, Dr. Chitra, I wanted to know the exact mechanism, how subclinical hypothyroidism affects fertility. For example, a TSH is 4.5. With a normal free T4, how do you think it affects fertility? Yeah, as already, Madam has already told, this uh, subclinical hypothyroidism in the patients who are uh, conceiving, the incidence is has as uh, 4 to 8%. So, until unless we evaluate the other factors, and this is a, one of the most common factor with the patient with subclinical hypothyroidism is the annual to cycles. This will affect our infertility, and also it might lead to the adverse uh, perinatal or uh, pregnancy and the neonatal outcomes. The studies have shown, like Madam has told, like an increase in mm -hmm. miscarriage rate, preterm labor, or it is also to the uh, offspring. The main pathology behind the subclinical hypothalamus is an annuality cycles. Okay. Since the woman's TSH was four, would you still have considered referring or replacement with thyroxine in this patient? Would you have referred to the endocrinologist or done something if the TSH was four? Mm -hmm. Because some of the laboratories, the TSH level is 4.5. Not always they get this controversy. What exactly is the cutoff and when do you exactly treat? Is it 2.5 or 4? Actually, as you, told, as you already told, it is a very controversial because there's still now there's no randomized control trials which have done that supplementation has improved the pregnancy rate. But uh, according to American Thyroid Association, there is a very weak recommendation like given thyroxine in this patient, especially patients who are undergoing uh, assisted reproductive techniques, it has shown to have an improvement in the pregnancy rate like implantation rate and the clinical pregnancy rate and also have a good cognitive development in the offsprings. So uh, usually as I Especially, I usually give a low dose of thyroxine in patients who are TSH level is around uh, four. Uh, just I might think that might be one of the underlying uh, cause might infertility. So some patients have consumed spontaneously, but I told you it's always a controversial and an individual experience. So you aim to yeah. keep the TSH less yeah. than Madam uh, two point yes two point five. Doctor Anjali, do you agree that we treat all patients with the TSH of four? Uh, I think now uh, the current guidelines which have come, uh, they have stressed more on using population-specific cutoffs. Now, earlier we were following the American guidelines and we were treating all women who were having TSH about 2.5. But then we have a lot of data coming from our own country which have actually shown higher values of TSH in normal women, normal mm -hmm. pregnant women without autoimmunity or family history of thyroid disease. So when we look at the normative data, in, in our Asian population, we can actually accept a little higher value of TSH. 
So a value which is bordering on four, four you have used a very uh, dicey cutoff. I would definitely look for thyroid antibodies. And if she look at her family history, here if you apply to this case scenario with a past history of miscarriage, yes, I would go ahead with treatment. And I would like to keep the TSH below 2.5. So I think the clinical decision rests with the physician because we need to look at the risk scenario. We need, look to, need to look at the family uh, background. Also, as Madam pointed out, if the patient is going for assisted reproduction, uh, yes, all subfertile women must be screened for thyroid. And if they have a TSH above 2.5, screen them for thyroid antibodies. And probably there is no robust data to say that you thyroid, thyroid antibody positive, we need to treat. But at least those women who are thyroid antibody positive, we need to follow them up during uh, pregnancy in new thyroid case. And if they have subclinical hypothyroidism, treat them even before they go ahead. So for okay. ARP, I think uh, we may be justified because there is, if you look at the benefit versus harm ratio, we are using a very tiny dose, something to the tune of 25 mites of thyroxine, and it's not going to harm the patient. So, okay. yeah. So, so, so in patients who have got bad obstetric history, infertility, subclinical yeah. hypothyroidism, euthyroid antibody positive, and in patients who are going for ART, we treat the TSH if it is more than 2.5 and we aim to normalize it. That's, I think that's to summarize uh, the last um, question that we were discussing. So we're going on to the fourth case and then we'll be taking um, the opinion of all the panelists and the questions from the delegates. So fourth case about how prolactin, hyperprolactinemia can cause subfertility. So the 27 year old female married for two years. She's been trying to conceive for the past one year. Her periods are irregular, 45 to 60 day cycle. She does not have any other complaints. There's no other significant past medical history. So these are her initial lab investigations. The TSH is normal, just to make it um, simple. This case, TSH is normal. FSH and LH are normal the prolactin is elevated. So Dr. Oma, how does hyperprolactinemia affect the ovarian function? What is the mechanism? Hyperprolactinemia, what is causes is it affects the pulse style release of uh, GnRH. So if pulse style release of GnRH is affected, it uh, causes FSH and LH uh, decrease. And there is a not a um, coherent synthesis of LH and FSH, which so affects ovulation. Sometimes what it causes is it suppresses the um, hypothalamic pituitary axis so much. So it causes hypothalamic pituitary dysfunction. And it even causes hypo, hypo, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism in some women. So menstrual irregularity is there. So ovulation is affected. So anovulatory cycles are there. And um, it also affects the luteal phase as well. So it causes luteal phase defects as well. This is how it affects the subfertility. Subfertility. Okay. So what is the prevalence of hyperprolactinemia in the infertile patients? So you, you see lots of infer patients with infertility. When you screen them, what exactly is the pre uh, prevalence of hyperprolactinemia? I mean, if you look at uh, the subfertile group of uh, women, hyperprolactinemia presents in about 5% of the patients, those who are subfertile. But if you look globally, I mean, the presence of uh, hyperprolactinemia is quite uh, not that high in a normal population, but in subfertile group, it accounts to about 5%. Okay. Dr. Krishna, what are the causes of elevated prolactin? If this patient is referred to your outpatient, how would you evaluate? this patient? So uh, the commonest causes are uh, so equally divided. It's drugs and microprolactinoma. So again, increasing more common is drugs because simply because we use any of the one of the drugs quite commonly, it is proton pump inhibitor, a common usage as well as histamine blockers. So, and previous, maybe they used uh, some any sort of hormone replacement therapies or OCPs for in case patient has got a PCOS or trying for fertility. Uh, so those things can influence and cause a mild estrogen effect and mild elevation of prolactin. So again, it can perpetuate the vicious cycle. So these are the common scenarios. Uh, so another common cause is unnoted is hypothyroidism. So many times even mild subclinical hypothyroidism have been shown to cause uh, gradual elevation of prolactin. Definitely overt hypothyroidism is the cause of second hyperlactinemia. You need to just correct the hypothyroidism. Again, organic disorders are microadenomas. Prolactin secreting microadenomas, macroadenomas, 
and other secondary cell or supracellular tumors causing a stock compression and a loss of an inhibitory do uh, dopamine effect causing secondary rise in prolactin so these are the causes of elevated prolactin common being drugs so i i would uh, like to add that physiological increase um after intercourse uh, if they've had a hot shower pregnancy as such so if the patient is amenorrheic and comes in with an elevated prolactin no not at this level maybe slightly higher then we should not miss pregnancy as a cause of um, hyperprolactinemia though it will not be in the hundreds it will be much more um stress if they do not like bloods being taken i've had this level of uh, hyperprolactinemia this actually is a patient who came to my clinic and her prolactin level was 125 so before going on to investigation of the other pituitary axis or mri i would just simply repeat the prolactin levels uh, just making sure the patient is not on any medications to see if the prolactin level is normal before doing um, an mri to look for um micro or macro adenoma so the, the subsequent visit after a couple of months i did the prolactin level it was only 25 in this young woman so how would you evaluate hyperprolactinemia further in this patient dr krishna i think you touched upon but if you could just emphasize sure sure so as dr ujya put so somewhere so keep keep the range as a guide most of the times in, it is a concurrent usually the size of the uh, prolactin secreting adenoma correlates usually correlates with the level of prolactin so usually the prolactin in the female the normal cutoff being usually less than 20 but if you want to uh, consistently say uh, it's usually beyond 30 to 40 you need to start thinking of uh, hyperprolactinemia first look at look at their drug list it may be an arterial medication or any other affecting drugs non essential um, just stop it not for a long period of time even uh, guidelines say even 3 to 5 days is enough so ideally at least 7 days 3 to 5 days is enough and stop it and reassess of course uh, any estrogen influencing drugs uh, any hormonal therapy you need to stop for 4 weeks at least so that is uh, you need to discuss with the patient and accordingly stop because we might we is not treating a reversible uh, cause of prolactin elevation easily reversible cause if its prolactin is more than 100 usually more than 200 are more than 100 with the field defect visual field defect which can be assessed uh, in your in our clinic with the, uh, the field testing itself so it is prudent to go for an mri so usually if it's more than 100 guidelines say it's more than 200 but in our country it's very difficult to follow up the patient so even if more than 100 with the headache or a field defect on the chronicity of situation go for a uh, mri with symptoms like galactoria uh, infertility oligomenorrhea amenorrhea so go for an mri so this will be the evaluation of case with hyperprotinemia of course you need to do the thyroid functions definitely thyroid functions needs to be corrected uh, sometimes reassess after the thyroid functions are corrected and uh, many times as uh, dr vidya said uh, after stop, stopping the affecting drugs uh, giving uh, um, uh, take out the stress rule out pregnancy and reassess after a few weeks you will be able to get the correct values sometimes evaluation may not be even needed or sometimes you may get a higher value you need to go for Uh, the and mri mri okay. specifically another common test don't add it, put an mri brain so always and this is a common uh, phenomena so try to uh, communicate with the radiologist go for an mri pituitary you are dealing with the sub centimeter gland the brain is uh, uh, simply like 10 cm you are reading a sub centimeter gland go for a mri pituitary when you discuss with the radiologist okay so this patient of mine um, had a pituitary microadenoma um so microadenoma is any um pituitary adenoma less than 1 cm so how would you manage this patient and um, i would what i would like to know is you know with this patient that i mean obviously we will be starting on something like gabapentin or bromocriptin what is the safety of these medications in pregnancy how long would you give um you know and how long would you continue into pregnancy so this has been uh, uh... evolving particularly in the past 10 years a um, lot of data a lot of inputs have been put and endocrine society have been uh, have put up a guideline and recent revisions have been done so cabergolin uh, bromocriptin and quinagolate are basically dopamine agonists so they basically have the inhibition on prolactin dopamine agonist so cabergolin has been shown to be the uh, uh, having the least adverse uh, least adverse profile as compared to bromocriptin which was conventionally used for the past 50 years so cabergolin in india it's relatively less cheaper 
bromocrypt is very cheap gabapolin only twice a week is required and coming to safety profile when uh, common scenario is again the moment you put on a dopamine agonist patient becomes pregnant the next month they come with a the pregnancy then we might wonder a patient is in 8 weeks or 9 weeks of pregnancy do we need to stop the drug or continue the drug was the drug safe uh, are we going to ensue for teratogenicity the answer until now the evidence have shown a teratogenic effect or whatever adverse profile in the first trimester of pregnancy is very very low even if you put on cabergolin or if bromocryptin doesn't matter the safety profile is good the data much more is with bromocryptin most safest evidence with bromocryptin but doesn't matter cabergolin no issues at all until now the data is safe uh, uh, if you know the cabergolin has been put patient is in the first trimester of pregnancy so okay. quinagolate better to avoid and conventionally um, i realize that uh, none of most of the physicians as definitely endos and uh, and gain police have stopped using quinagolin quinagolin so uh, bromocryptin or cabergolin both are safe for cabergolin less adverse event profile quinagolin so, is associated with congenital anomaly so i i haven't per se used it even in a non pregnant woman i haven't used quinagolin at all so once prolactin is normalized with dopaminergic agonist how would you monitor ovulation dr uma Uh, normally ovulation is monitored uh, by um, doing follicular studies so we do uh, monitor the growth of the follicles uh, other thing uh, what we generally do is like we can do the lh um, uh, increase um, uh, just a couple of days before when the follicle size is around 16 18 mm but the precise test to check for ovulation is like day 21 serum progesterone or when another follicle kind of is about 18 20 mm when it ruptures then you can do the serum progesterone assay which gives you a consistent clue but uh, one of my professors used to say that the best method to monitor ovulation is like the, when the patient gets pregnant that's the one thing which is always being said but we do monitor with progesterone levels okay so if the patient still fails to conceive what would be the next treatment option it takes a long time for um, uh, prolactin sometimes in some women to get even though it gets normalized it takes 6 months for them to fall pregnant naturally in those kind of patients what you could do is like you can start them with ovulation induction with gonadotropins so most of them to do um, have ovulation or their follicle starts growing and then they fall pregnant if it fails the pulse style uh, gnrh uh, administrations one of the treatment options which is dealt with in patients with hypogonadotropic hypogonadism they're not going to respond to your gonadotropins alone so pulse style gnrh is one of the options the advantage of giving pulse style gnrh gnrh analogs uh, is um, the risk of multiple pregnancies being avoided with that okay So, Dr. Krishnan, just briefly, uh, very briefly, how is pituitary micro or macro adenoma managed in the postpartum period? Do you still continue um, gabapolin, or what would you do? Well, there was a quite a confusion. Now, I, I think it's being cleared. Uh, uh, basically, we can stop it. We need not continue it. Usually, not needed. Definitely, in case of micro adenoma, macro adenoma, unless the tumor is huge, causing a neuro de- deficit or of uh, chiasmal compression, you need to continue. Okay. So the last question I'm um, just to summarize what happens to non pathological hyperprolactinemia after delivery so there's no micro or macro prolactinoma so what happens every time a patient becomes pregnant is i think the answer is there dr uma would you like to to say yeah. why it has to be after uh, pregnancy their prolactin levels becomes normal or it doesn't cause them a major um, uh their issue in any of the ways and their um, uh milk secretion and the breastfeeding is completely normal with them so it normalizes after delivery okay so that's that's what the evidence shows that every time a, you know after the second or third pregnancies even if the patient had mild hyperprolactinemia it seems to normalize we don't have to do much so to any of the other panelists have anything else to add with regards to the other questions dr anjali dr chitra dr krishna and dr uma you can add in any of you know your opinions before we take the question from the um the audience um uh, i think dr krishna i concur with dr krishna about whatever he had said from an endocrinologist pers- perspective but there is also an entity known as macro prolactin so i think i just want one more message that prolactin is a very labile hormone and it can get elevated in small situations like stress 
sleep deprivation or as uh, you know even medication and it with one dose of cabagolin we see a rapid crash in the you know uh, prolactin levels now if a woman presents with hyperprolactinemia but has no symptoms of uh, anovulation she has regular cycles and she has no galactoria amenorrhea syndrome but just has a high prolactin with no history suggestive of a drug intake we need to rule out a condition known as macroprolactinemia because prolactin in circulation exists as small prolactin a big prolactin and a big big where prolactin gets complexed with other immunoglobulins and we can do a test known as a peg precipitation in labs called polyethylene glycol precipitation which removes this macroprolactin which is a non functional prolactin you you estimate it in an immunoassay as a high value but it is biologically inactive so women who are totally asymptomatic with hyperprolactinemia we need to rule out this entity known as macroprolactin and it if it needs no intervention thank you so we have a thank you dr anjali we have a question from the audience uh, dr harish asked what about a very likely possibility that pro thrombotic prevention with aspirin in autoimmune states might be uh, needed with or without prednisolone contributing to preventing miscarriages rather than only pushing the tsh down so is there any role for aspirin in patients with autoimmune disorders or in patients with diabetes i remember we used to we um endocrinologists we used to use um aspirin after the patient is 12 weeks of gestation especially in type 1 type 2 diabetics but um would you, any of the panelists would like to add in autoimmune disorders adding aspirin to prevent prothrombotic state mm -hmm. no there's not um, much of evidence to say that uh, aspirin adding aspirin is going to prevent your miscarriage rate or uh, thrombotic events in future but being a fertility consultant if one of my um, patients who has got an autoimmune problem is going to have an ivf cycle and uh, i would like to start them on uh, aspirin while i'm doing the embryo transfer so to prevent uh, i mean it's anecdotal i don't have evidence to say that it prevents but i do add okay so we have just a couple of questions from the audience um there was somebody has asked why do lft i think dr krishna shankar has covered to ensure the patient does not have autoimmune hepatitis or in an obese patient there is no evidence of nash um and there's another question on what do you advise for weight reduction i think we have already covered that weight reduction itself could be a topic of discussion we wouldn't be able to cover that in the session on subfertility there was another question on a 9 year old girl with a normal bmi and signs of hyperandrogenism again that doesn't come under this uh, topic of subfertility and endocrine uh, disorders but again that would be again to um look into uh, premature uh, you know precocious puberty and things like that um thank you very much uh, for all the uh, panelists dr anjali dr chitra dr uma and dr krishna for your valuable time and uh, contribution it has been a great discussion and it's been a great opportunity to meet you all um uh, for the session and i'm i'm hope that we will do more sessions in the future thank you very much thank, thank you vidya it was a very good moderation i am sure the audience would have got a lot of fun our discussion and thank you all the co panelists uh, for giving us such a lot of feedback i just want uh, only one from all the endocrinologists here uh, if you have a one minute dr akshaya is it okay uh, ma'am it's already yeah no just for the uh, gynecologist uh, when you have to refer the patient with hyperprolactinemia to the endocrinologist and when they can manage on the report i uh, just one uh, last uh, i would say refer all hyperprolactinemia to us Okay, you can manage it. So, so we do not over investigate. <laughs> Just refer all hyperprolactinemia to us, and we will uh, take good care of your patients. I'm sure all the endocrinologists will agree with that. Okay, <laughs> I would defer with that. <laughs> Because I've seen most of them starting on their own, the cabalcolin or the bromocriptin. Being an institution, we do refer. It's safer. Due to the reference we get, they would have already given a treatment. So yeah. I just want one opinion to so all the. That muddies so. the picture. That once a patient is on cabalcolin, that muddies the picture, and that's very little left for us to do at that at that point. So better we start investigating from scratch before you start on cabalcolin. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank you very.